Hey, it's Jacob, and I'm so excited and thrilled to announce that my brand new book, Leading with Vulnerability, is now officially available for pre-order. You can head over to leadwithvulnerability.com to pre-order your copy. It's based on 100 CEO interviews and a survey of 14,000 employees around the world. This book was so hard for me to write that a few weeks after signing the contract for the book, I had a panic attack. That just gives you a sense of what I had to put into this book to make it a reality. Uh, my family comes from the former USSR. Uh, even though my mom tried to be emotionally vulnerable, I grew up emulating my dad, who is not vulnerable at all. So being confronted with writing about something that is very foreign to me made me have a panic attack. I share more about that in the book itself. Interestingly enough, uh, some of the CEOs that I interviewed also shared that they had panic attacks too. I interviewed 100 CEOs, surveyed 14,000 employees around the world, and I started off with a simple and basic question. Is vulnerability for leaders the same as it is for everybody else? And the answer to that question is a resounding no. Leaders should not be vulnerable. They should lead with vulnerability. But what does that mean and how do you do it the right way? To find out, head over to leadwithvulnerability.com. You can pre-order your copy. And if you pre-order a hardcover copy, you're going to get access to some really cool bonuses, including a couple exclusive CEO interviews. You're going to get access to uh, advanced sneak peek of the book, a couple chapters, and you will be invited to an exclusive and private webinar that I'm going to be hosting, sharing some of the concepts and themes from the book before anybody else gets it. Again, go to leadwithvulnerability.com. When you're developing strategy in the world, especially today, you need to bring other people along. You need to convince them that your vision of both objective and path makes sense. My guest today is Charles Kahn, Patagonia board chair, CEO of Monograph Capital, which is a life science venture firm. He's also the former CEO of Oxford Sciences and the founding CEO of Ticketmaster City Search. On top of all of that, he has a new book out, which I had a chance to take a look at, which is called Imperfectionists, Strategic Mindsets for Uncertain Times. How do you think about strategy? Strategy is dynamic problem solving, which may be exactly what you said in slightly different words. To have a strategy, you have to have a strategic objective. You have to have a set of steps that you believe will move you toward that objective. And you have to have a corporate process that would allow you to execute that strategy. Charles, thank you for joining me. Jacob, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Let's start with a little bit of background information for people who might not be familiar with you and some of the work that you've done. Um, and then maybe on top of that, you can give a little bit of context around why you decided to write this book. Sure. So um, where to start? Um, you know, I, I'm um, a daily practitioner of uh, strategic problem solving as chair of Patagonia. And uh, in the companies that I invest in, uh, which are mostly um, small life sciences and health tech companies. But I also work with the Nature Conservancy, um, uh, and, and I'm on their board in Europe, where we're trying to solve you know, the giant problems of the planet as well as the smaller problems of uh, country by country. So I've, I've, I have a life that's involved in strategic problem solving, and it really has always been my calling um, for more than 30 years now. And you were at McKinsey for a while as well, right? Yeah, that's right. Kind of got my had my beginning at McKinsey and I, I met my co-author Rob McLean yep. there um, and thought a lot about kind of strategy the way we used to think about strategy 30 years ago. And it's partly that, that grounding that had Rob and me write what we think is quite a different book and approach to strategy. When you talk about strategy, how do you explain what strategy is? Because you know, for me, yeah. for example, I play a lot of chess. And so the way that I think about strategy, which very much applies to the realm of business, is kind of, um, you know, planning in a series of strategic decisions that you make that ultimately let you move towards the goal that you were ch trying to achieve, which in the game of chess is checkmate, winning pieces, things of that nature. And so that's that's kind of how I formulate it, right? It's just kind of a series of decisions that you take over time. Yeah. How do you think about strategy. Would you say that that's a good way to? I like your definition a lot. Um, 
uh, my definition is pretty close to that, which is strategy is dynamic problem solving, which may, which may be exactly what you said in slightly different words. Yeah. I think we used to think about strategy and, um, and we were all taught to think about strategy in, a, in an older model, you know, which, which Michael Porter summarized yes. well, but which came out of academic economics work, which has us look at the structure of uh, an industry, the players in the industry, and then to deduce the likely conduct in the industry. Yep. Um, and that was also true in a lot of the structured game theory of the 1940s and 1950s. And I think that kind of thinking about corporate strategy in the business world doesn't really work very well anymore. Mm. So um, how can people, and I know this might sound like a weird question, but um, how do you know if you have a strategy or not? Like, how do you know if you're just making individual atomized decisions that are not connected with each, with, with each other? <clears throat> how do you know if you have like a, a core strategy in place? Are there certain elements or components that are required in order to say, hey, I have a strategy of how I'm going to approach this, or is it different case by case and problem by problem? No, I th actually think that's a really good question. And I think, you know, sometimes historically people have contrasted strategy and tactics, yeah. and that may, be, that may be an informative way of thinking about this. Um, I, th you know, you see lots of companies that don't have strategies. What they'll say is we have a strategy, we're going to grow our market share by 15%. Yeah. Well, that's not a that's not a strategy, that's an objective, and that's not even a very interesting objective, right? Um, you know, sim simply doing what you've done before in order to grow your market share is precisely why so many companies end up in trouble and disrupted. Um, uh, to have a strategy, you have to have a strategic objective, you have to have a set of steps that you believe will move you toward that objective, and you have to have a corporate process that would allow you to execute that strategy. I think that strategy is also, and Go I was going to say, I think that corporate process piece is, is really interesting. So maybe after you finish your thought, we can jump back to that corporate process. Yeah. Well, I was going to say is that, you know, um, I think Mike Tyson is famous for yeah. saying, you know, strategy, strategy ends uh, when someone punches you. Everyone in the mouth. has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Yeah. <laughs> right. Which is, you know, a parap paraphrasing <laughs> a, a, a general uh, 250 years ago who said something very similar um, obviously strategy has to be responsive. Um, and when you think about game theory, you're always thinking about what will the other actor do? And therefore strategy and tactics actually have to go together. Yep. But if you're merely reacting to the other player, you don't have a strategy. Mm. It's funny. It's, it's so analogous to the game of chess. Um, I yeah. almost wish like everybody out there played chess because everything would make so much more sense in terms of Tactics and, tactics and strategy where strategy is kind of the overall plan that you have for the game, whereas the tactics are like the little one, two, maybe three move combinations that you try to put into place, um, you know, in, in the shorter term as opposed to the longer term. So it makes a, a complete parallel. Um, what is yeah. wrong with the way most companies approach strategy now? Because I think a lot of people would know and, and remember that Corporations used to have five, 10 year strategies, you know, sometimes even 15, 20 years out in the future. And that used to be very common, right? You'd get a lot of executives, a lot of leaders together, maybe a facilitator, and you would start to brainstorm and come up with where we want to be in five years and 10 years. And today, it seems like that's all but an exercise in creativity because by the time you're even done creating that strategy, you see something new is introduced whether it's technology, yeah. whether it's AI, whether it's something geopolitical, it, it just things are moving so quickly. Why is that long-term approach to strategy not, not effective anymore? And what is the maximum length that you would advise an organization to like look out into the future? Yeah, I think that's a great set of questions. I mean, I guess what I would say is, I think it's perfectly fine to have long-term objectives. And a company like Patagonia has had a very common set of objectives over the course of 50 years. Yeah. Um, and you could express that as saying, you know, we, we want to make the best gear. We want to do the least harm. And we want to use the, 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 the power of business in order to create change. And that kind of a long-term uh, set of goals is something you could imagine being relatively evergreen. But how you achieve those goals needs to change. And in a world that's changing, um, and you describe some of the vectors of change, when you have 
uh, pro programmable biology, automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, yeah. Uh, now, learning models, when we have pandemic, when we have war, the stability that, that allowed us to have those conversations that we had 20 and 30 years ago is gone. Yeah. So that kind of idea that there's a stable industry structure and a set of players inside that structure and that they will behave in a particular way, all of that is out the window in the world we live in today. Yeah. And you, know, you think about the rise of super competitors like... Apple or Amazon or Google or Microsoft, the people who disrupt you in your business, whether you're making, you know, you know, new gene therapies or you're making genes <laughs> is unlikely to be someone who's an existing competitor from inside your industry yep. more than ever has been true before. So that idea that there's some kind of stable industry structure and there's a stable set of players and we can say something about how they're going to behave None of those assumptions hold true. Mm. So we can still look at long-term goals, like when Amazon wanted to be in consumer financial services. Yep. That was a goal that they started as early as, say, 2006 or 2007, and not one that they probably have stopped achieving now in 2023. Yep. But how they did it has changed a lot along the way. And that idea that we could somehow plan out 30 moves ahead doesn't work very well. Yep. Couldn't agree more. Um, so if you're not planning 30 moves ahead, how many moves ahead are you planning? Because I, I like the concept of having kind of like a vision of where you want to yeah. go. But if you're actually sitting together and, and, you know, with your leadership team and coming up with a strategic plan, how does that plan, <clears throat> if you have a vision 10 years out in the future, obviously you're not going to have a strategy that's going to map out everything that you do for the next 10 years. Or, or I don't know, maybe you will. But how how long of a strategy timeline should you have leading up to those long-term goals? Yeah. Well, so my, my sense is, first of all, that we shouldn't run a single strategy strand. Um, just like in, you know, in, in a chess game, you have to make a move. Yes. But you probably have five or six different strands of the game, depending on what your competitor does. Yes. So I think we should be running two or three or four sets of strategic moves at any moment in time. I think we should accept and understand that a number of those moves are going to fail and that doesn't mean you're a failure. And, and as long as you learn something from each strategic move and maybe build your capabilities and asset positions, there's nothing that's a failure about mm. that. And I like the idea that we push strategy closer to the front line of organizations okay. rather than imagining this sort of boffin sitting you know, back in some corporate office somewhere who doesn't really know what customers are thinking or what competitors are thinking. Yep. So... I would like to think of two or three strategic strands and imagining probably three or four moves out, maybe five moves out. You know, you're a chess player. How many moves ahead can you reasonably think, taking into account that each move will be countered by your opposition? Well, it depends if it's like a forced series of moves, right? So, for example, yeah. sometimes on the chessboard, there might be like a forced checkmate in four or five or six. Um, sure. And so th the interesting thing that I find, and I suppose this could be relevant to the business world. So I have a chess coach that I work with. And oftentimes, if there is a forced mate, let's say it's even in six, and he'll push me yeah. and he'll say, okay, calculate up to here. Okay, now calculate one move further. Now calculate one move further. If I'm forced and pushed into calculating further, I can. But usually I stop and the chess coach that I work with would say, well, why'd you stop? like go one move further and then I'll give him one more move and he'll say, okay, now go one move further, like find the mate. And I think it's very applicable to the business world because sometimes when we are forced yeah. into a position, we can tend to make better, like it's easier to make the strategic business decisions because they're forced, like you don't have another option. Whereas when we have yeah. lots of options, obviously you can't see that far ahead and you can only do maybe like two, three moves. So yeah. And maybe that's why legacy businesses are so liable to be disrupted, yeah. right? Because they stasis is actually a choice. Yep. So in, in chess, you have to keep going. And you probably play chess where you tap a timer yep. and you have to play against the timer. In legacy businesses, especially those that have um, wonderful existing lines of business, they often get people often get paralyzed. Yeah. They can't see three moves ahead. They get panicked when they start thinking about new entrants, and so they freeze. Mm. And I think the world we've just been through with pandemic and war 
and now the, all the overlays of new learning, uh, large, large uh, learning models, many people with legacy businesses have just stopped and said, I'm going to wait until things stabilize. Yeah. Guess what? They're not going to stabilize, right? Imagine if the rules of chess were, were, were changing as you were playing. Yeah, that would make it quite tough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I suppose that if you were to look back a decade or two or three decades ago, it used to be more forced moves. Like you, you, you didn't have as much variety and option because yeah. things were relatively static and stagnant. And you, you had a pretty good sense of what was going to happen over the next few years. But yeah, now there's right. so much variety that it's very hard because you're constantly being put in front of like new positions, new right. scenarios. And so you're confronted with so many things that it's hard to right. have that kind of long-term calculation. Right. So think about gasoline retailing, you know, 40 years ago. Oh yeah. What were the choices that they what were the choices that an individual gas station faced? Look, race race price or lower price. Yep. And they would do that in reference to a competitor that was usually within a visibility within within eye shot of where they were. Mm. Right? And then sometime in the 1980s People started competing in gas stations based on mini marts that were attached to the gas stations. Yep. And then they might be comp competing not only on the gas price, but the price of a gallon of milk. And then think about what competition looks like in petroleum retailing today, yeah. right? Where there's electric cars and people actually choosing to work from home. Yeah. So I think the layers of, um, of what it takes to be competitively differentiated are just vastly more complicated yeah. today. I mean, it makes it more fun and more dynamic as well. Um, I wanted to go back to something you mentioned a few minutes ago, and you were alluding to this um, idea that obviously Patagonia is trying to make positive change in the world. And there's been this kind of big debate on the role that businesses play when it comes to things like social causes or fighting for injustices, or should a business just be a business? And you see a lot of different examples of what happened with companies like Target or Bud Light or um, Starbucks went through things years ago. What role do you think a business plays in the realm of social causes, right? Because some people might say, hey, you know what? I just want to go to Patagonia to buy a jacket. Like, I don't care about the social yeah. causes. I don't care about all the other stuff that you're doing. Don't tell me about climate change. Just give me my jacket and I want to get the hell out of there. And then there are other companies who yeah. say, you know what? We believe that we're supposed to be um, taking a stance on causes that we believe in. And so it's it's a very difficult dynamic. I mean, it's part of this chess game that companies are trying to figure out. Yeah, and I don't think there's one answer, and I don't think there needs to be one answer. But um, at Patagonia and me personally are very much opposed to, you know, the view that was crystallized so well by Milton Friedman in his 1970 article that was actually appeared in the New York Times of all places, which said that the only legitimate purpose of business is to seek profit. Yep. And um, we don't we don't agree with that at all. You know, companies are embedded in the communities in which they operate and companies should have purposes and those purposes are, are, are you know, should be understood by their, by their customers and those make better businesses, Yeah. right? Whether, whether you like Patagonia or you like Chick-fil-A, those are two businesses that stand for something yeah. and the customers know what they stand for. And so, you know, we started off talking about strategic objectives. Patagonia's strategic objectives are deeply rooted in our values as a company mm. and the way we want to show up in the world and what we stand for with regard to, you know, climate change, our employees and the communities in which we operate. I think it makes us strategically stronger to be grounded in that way. Yeah, I was actually just looking up this quote that I, I remembered, and it was also, it was from 1979, and it was the Quaker Oats president at the time, Kenneth Mason. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the quote that that he provided, but he said that making a profit is no more the purpose of a corporation than getting enough to eat is the purpose of life. Uh, getting enough to right. eat is a requirement for life, but life's purpose, one would hope, is somewhat broader and more challenging, likewise with business and profit. And I thought it was a great quote that kind of countered the, um, the, the Milton... Yeah. Milton Freeman point that <laughs> so many organizations have been following over the years. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, and, you know, Jack Welsh and GE were famous for it and look where GE is. Oh, today. Yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 I think he didn't pay attention to his staff. He didn't care about the communities in which he operated. And ultimately those businesses um, didn't thrive and succeed. So, you know, for, for me, the Milton Friedman view requires believing that there aren't any externalities. Yeah. We know that isn't true. You know, as businesses, we actually have a responsibility 
you know, and maybe this is where profit and purpose actually have to come together. If you think about it as a hundred year game, they must come together because um, as David Brower said, you can't do business on a dead planet. Yep. <laughs> I think the challenge for a lot of consumers and also for businesses is to know which organizations are genuine in the things that they are pursuing versus yeah. what are the pursuits that organizations are going after for the sake of, I guess you could call it virtual, uh, virtue signaling. And there are some brands like Patagonia, which have had you know many, many years long commitment to something like a climate change. And then on the flip side of that, you see some organizations that just pop up out of nowhere and just say, we're supporting this, we're supporting that. And it tends to be kind of like the trend that, that they're going after, which I think is challenging. And you, you alluded to a point, which is um, the kind of letting customers know what you stand for. And that, to me, has been a big challenge for organizations because the fear has always been, as you know, to, you know, you play in the gray area. That way you don't upset anybody. You'd say, yeah, we're not going to talk yeah. about it. We're a little bit here. We're a little bit there. But the big fear now for, I think, a lot of leaders shouldn't be that you're going to upset customers or employees. It's that your customers or your employees don't know what you stand for to begin with. And that, to me, is a far bigger problem than you upsetting somebody. And so I think we're seeing more of this taking a stance and letting people know what we believe. And it's okay if you disagree with me, we can be, you know, we can disagree in a respectful way, but this is kind of what our organization stands for. I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, that's a beautiful encapsulation of what we believe. Yeah. Patagonia. And, you know, frankly, I think that's a, the most profound business strategy says, here's what we stand for. Yeah. And what do you do if you say you stand for something and people disagree? Um, I, you can bring out uh, Target or Bud Light, right? Two very famous uh, examples that have happened lately. And, you know, they, they came out, they said that they stand for, you know, various social causes and they had some a severe backlash. What do you do in those situations where what you say you stand for alienates customers or goes against what the company has done for so many years and you do see such a backlash. Do you pull back? I mean, like if you were advising Target and Bud Light and those organizations, how would you approach the difficult situations that they now find themselves in? Yeah, I know, you know, I think, uh, you know, there's uh, there's obvious, obviously two answers. One is, you know, back up and say you didn't mean it or lean into it because you yeah, did. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You can probably imagine which one I would favor, yeah. um, which is the second of those. And to accept that you won't um, please everybody all of the time and that most people will actually respect you if you if you stand for something. Yeah. You know, well, you, you, you were alive in the 1980s. You might have liked Ronald Reagan or you might not have liked Ronald Reagan, but you knew what he stood yep. for. Yeah. Right? And, I, I you know. Those do look like miscalculations to me that, you know, that they didn't spend enough time with their customers making clear what their values were. Um, you know, you know what Chick-fil-A stands yes. for. They're very clear. Yes. And, you know, I, I have many friends who don't believe in those values and they still will go in and eat, eat the sandwich because it's a good sandwich. And I have other friends who say, you know what? I don't need the sandwich that yeah. much. That's fair. That's fair. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, so. Getting back to some of the original concepts that we were talking about, well, I guess just to kind of wrap this up, it seems like the important thing is first calculate properly, and this goes to the theme of strategy, right? If you are going to stand up for a social cause or fight for something, and I, I wrote an article about this a few weeks ago where I gave a little bit of a framework for how companies should be thinking about this, where you look at um, you know, the values of the organization, you look at the customers, you look at having a crisis plan, you look at the long-term and short-term impact that this could have to your brand. And you have to think about and evaluate these things before you come out and, you know, jump into something. And I think the challenge is a lot of organizations are not doing that. And to your point, it seems like you do have two options if you do get involved in something. One is you, you know, backpedal and say, we didn't mean it. Or the other one is you double down and say, hey, you know, this is the direction of our company and this is what we should do. So I, I like the way, I think that gives people a very clear direction on on the options that they have. Yeah. Um, I, the, the two things I think that you talked about in the book as far as like, um, you know, opposing sides, one is sometimes organizations can take too long to make a choice. Mm -hmm. And sometimes organizations can make a choice too quickly. And we, of course, have seen lots of examples of those companies taking too long. You get the, you know, the blockbusters of the world. 
um, companies jumping in too quickly. You see some of what's happening in today's uh, climate with some of the businesses out there. How do you find that balance? Like, how do you know that I'm <laughs> at that sweet spot of, I waited long enough, but not too long? Yeah, I think that's a hard question to answer. And it probably differs for different types of businesses. You know, if you're making something that's um, quickly produced and quickly consumed, you probably can make changes very quickly yep. um, at the edge. And if you're making, you know, something like an automobile, which you know people are going to, you hope people will own for 10 years, um, you you can't make decisions that are, you know, uh, on, only as fresh as today's lettuce. Yeah. Right. So there's probably not a one size fits all to that. One thing I will say back to your example, though, which is, you know, when you wake when, when you wake up in the morning, Jacob, you, do you say to yourself, Today I today today I think I'll believe in integrity. <laughs> no. And you, no, you don't. You wake up every day and believe in integrity, yeah. right? And so, I think there's some choices um, that people position as if they were a choice that really shouldn't be a yeah. choice. Yeah, I like that. Um, so let's spend the next um, 10, 15 minutes or so looking at what your six strategy mindsets are. It would kind of do a little overview of each one, sure. and then the last 15, 20 minutes or so of the show we can dive into some action items for how leaders can practice and bring these mindsets into their organization. And I love the mindsets that you have. They're actually very similar to the mindsets that I found um, in my previous book, The Future Leader, when I interviewed 140 CEOs. A lot of these mindsets popped up there too, so I was, I was glad to see them. Um, so the first one Good. you have is curiosity. So what is, I think conceptually, a lot of people know what curiosity is as a mindset. But how do you think about it from a business context and leadership context? Yeah, so for me, curiosity is that, you know, is an instinct that uh, we all had when we were children, right? Where we didn't, we didn't have good pattern recognition engines as children. Mm -hmm. And so when we encountered something new in the world, we asked why or how or what, or when, you know, the obvious, the obvious uh, why, why, what, when questions. And as we get older, we start to uh, find successful patterns. So the first time you look at two shoelaces, you have no idea. And then the 30th time when you tie a bow, that becomes your pattern recognition for what to do with a shoelace. That's great. But what happens is as you become, as you move from being a pattern seeker to being a pattern recognizer, you become a, a pattern imposer. And then you stop asking good questions about the world. So you, every situation you look at, you immediately are imposing a past success pattern. Mm -hmm. That's great when nothing's changing. So for, for most of human history, when people did agriculture and they got eaten by wild creatures, those were, those were pretty good memes for them to pay attention to. Rustling in the bushes, run, right? Um, and I think the problem is in the world we live in today, which is changing so quickly and has so many rich choices, imposing past patterns of success is not a winning strategy. Mm. And going back to that childlike curiosity where you ask the question, am, am I seeing this clearly? In, instead of immediately imposing a pattern, asking, is this actually a, a new pattern? Is this something I've seen before? Trying to return to that place. You know, we use an example in the book that I love, which is um, Edwin Land was, you know, an incredible inventor. And he was walking around Santa Fe one day with his daughter, Jennifer. And he was taking pictures with his conventional film camera at the time. And his, his daughter, Jennifer, looked up at him and said, Daddy, can I see the picture? She grabbed his arm. And he kneeled down and he, and he explained to her, well, no, uh, you know, this is film is a chemical emulsion. And we're exposing light to it. And then we take it to the drugstore and the drugstore sends it to a lab. And then two weeks later, and he stopped himself and he said, why does it have to be that way? Even though he was an adult and even though he was a, 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 a incredibly talented chemist and inventor, he stopped and asked that curious question mm. or answered Jennifer's curious question with his own question. I wonder if I could do that. Yeah. And by the end of the day, he worked out instant uh, photography. And I think it's a rare, successful person who can retain curiosity. I love that. And, and when it is, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, you meet people yeah. like that. You think about someone like David Attenborough. Why do we love David Attenborough so much? 
Because he's still this excited and curious about the world that he's encountering at age 90. Yeah. No, it's a good uh, good story. I love that story. Um, all right, so the second one you have, Dragonfly. Um, and when I heard this one, I immediately thought of... Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this concept of the cone of possibilities. Mm -hmm. It's a framework. You've probably come across it at McKinsey and used it yeah. quite a bit. Um, so when I was getting my certification in foresight at the University of Houston, they taught this concept of the cone of possibilities, which is basically, for people not familiar with it, this idea where you look at different scenarios and possibilities over a series of time horizons. And not to come back to chess again, uh, there's so many like chess undertones in here, it's crazy. Um, but it's it's very much related to chess, right? To your point that you made earlier, you don't just take one move and make the one move. You try to think in terms of these scenarios and possibilities. Right. So that's what I immediately thought of. Uh, but I loved the, yeah. the dragonfly visual that you had in there. So maybe you could talk a little bit about yeah. that mindset. Yeah, so, you know, this is an analogy, obviously. We don't really know how the insect sees. What we do know, it has 30,000 lenses on these two compound eyes, and it has three simple eyes that are arrayed further back. We also have pretty good evidence that they see spectra of colors and and movement that are just vastly beyond what humans can see. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of an interesting analogy. Um, what we're encouraging people to do, which is sort of a step beyond but a sister to curiosity, is before you jump into a particular solution set, to try and see the problem from a variety of perspectives. So I'll grab chess again. I mean, you never make a chess move without thinking, well, what would the other party do yep. if they were faced with that chess move? And then you're, you're forced then to say, well, what would I do in response to what they would do? And you know, th that's of course how better chess players can do that more often. When we're in business or we're in nonprofits, the very least you can do is to imagine what your service or product looks like to the consumer instead of just thinking about what it means to produce from your side. Yeah. But maybe you should also think about a potential consumer. Mm. What does it look like to your competitor? Does this look like a, a fat, easy duck to your competitor? Or does it look like it'd be something hard to do? What about an incipient competitor? You know, Amazon seems to turn its, you know, Sauron-like eye to different businesses. Now it's looking at healthcare. If you're in healthcare, you shouldn't just imagine what another hospital would do but how, how would Amazon think about yeah. this, right? What would Andy Jassy be thinking? In, in a business like Patagonia, we're constantly thinking about our suppliers. Mm. You know, we work with chemists who develop new um, fabrics. How would they see this particular innovation? Yeah. And I, I, I think you can, this, this cone of possibilities is just such a relevant way of um, positioning yourself outside of yourself. It's literally that. Yeah right? Before you start making especially irreversible strategic moves. Remember to grab your copy of Leading with Vulnerability. Here's what Seth Godin had to say about the book. This is a well-researched, compelling book about something we spend far too little time thinking about. Being human, it works. So pre-order your copy at leadwithvulnerability.com. If you get a hardcover copy, you're going to get access to some really cool bonuses. Again, all the details and instructions are at leadwithvulnerability.com. Why do you think vulnerability is important? Everything you do is built on the foundation of relationships. Showing a bit of who you are is a good thing because any time that people feel that they're interacting with the real person, that is builds trust. Yeah. People need to see through your actions that what you do mm. is genuine and that it comes from a place that is genuine and authentic and not made up or thought about. Being open and being vulnerable uh, is important in that context of building yep. a relationship. If it doesn't serve to build a relationship, then you wonder what is the purpose, right? No, I love that, uh, the visual of the dragonfly there and just kind of seeing those different lenses. Yeah. Um, and I, I also like that you mentioned uh, Amazon as the, the eye of, of Sauron there because, yeah, I mean, there, I, if I was in an industry and Amazon had its eye set on me, I would be terrified because when you have that much in terms of resources and capital and you know that uh, and Amazon is coming after you, it's a little scary. Um, yeah, it is. So let's jump to the next one. So a current behavior. Yeah. What is that one? So it's a, it's a funny term, right? Um, we kind of like it because it makes you stop and think. Um, 
A current behavior is what actually happens, not what you hope will happen or what you think will happen. And we, we use the term to underscore the importance of doing your own experimentation rather than relying on data. When I was a management consultant uh, back in the 1980s, the first thing we'd do when we got a new assignment was to see if there was an existing data set that we could buy. Hmm. And I hate that way of thinking. Yeah. Because if there is an existing data set, everyone else has bought it too. And they've already been through it and they've already thought about it. So we like to start every um, strategic problem by asking, is there, so as we imagine the different potential moves we could make, can we test those moves with relatively low cost, relatively reversible experiments? And, you know, the, the, the world of the internet has given us this hyper experimentation mentality. Yep. But many people think that it only pertains to the internet. So A-B testing or A-B-C testing has become commonplace, but people assume it only means that you can tr that an e-commerce company can try three different interfaces and see which one sells more widgets. But this idea of finding experiments or developing experiments should be much broader than that, mm. right? During the pandemic, um, you, it's not ethical to experiment by trying two different strategies with two different, you know, with, with the same people. But we could look at two different jurisdictions, whether they were states or countries next door to each other that were otherwise demographically similar, and notice strategy A produced this result and strategy B produced this yeah. result. For example, in the book, we compare Sweden and Norway's approach to the pandemic. But it is also true that even in very heavy industries, you can do experimentation. And my favorite example here, whether you like Elon Musk or not, is SpaceX, you know, where you, you look at the ultimate heavy industry where NASA has spent 75 years spending billions and billions of dollars sending people and payloads into space. Along comes this startup upstart and goes from what NASA was doing three or four experiments a year um, to between 20 and 30 experiments a year. And while they're doing that, they're testing a whole bunch of new technologies like 3D printing of rocket parts and using nets to catch expensive nose cones so you don't lose them or taking ideas from the automotive industry, heat shielding, and seeing if you could apply those in, in a spaceship. And very importantly, understanding and accepting that some of these experiments will end in failure. Yeah. The most recent large rocket, I, th I think the description was an unplanned disassembly. <laughs> Right. Unplanned disassembly. You know, the, I love it. Right. The thing failed, but they knew they knew in advance that there was a significant chance it would fail. But there were 20 separate innovations that they were testing with that launch. And that was worth it to them. Hmm. The, 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 the sum of all that is that SpaceX has decreased the cost of sending a kilogram into space by 95 percent. Wow. I mean, that's insane. Yeah. Right. Like if someone had told you in 2000, the year 2000, that you can take 95% of the costs out of sending a kilogram into space after NASA had been doing it um, since the 1950s, you would say that's impossible. Yeah. And that's an experimentalist or imperfectionist approach to um, developing new ideas mm. for strategy, new information for strategy. Yeah, I mean, you can even look at the cost of storage today, right? I mean, I remember uh, no. a, a decade yeah. or two decades ago how much it would cost to just store like a couple megabytes on a SD card. Right. Now it's virtually free. You look at something like ChatGPT, also right. virtually free, and and the types of things that you can do with it are just kind of it's just mind boggling to say the least. Like if somebody were to tell me even a couple of years ago that hey, you know, you could just use this AI bot that's going to write better than most writers out there and, and do all these things. I'd be like, you're nuts. You know, it saves thousands of dollars for everybody a year for small businesses. It's crazy. Um, all right. Right. You can also say like some things are just guided by the laws of physics. And I think, you know, people have said, you know, Moore's law starts to break down, yeah. but then, then people use new materials to engineer around whatever those old, um, laws were. And I think we're seeing that with battery technology yeah. right now. Yes, maybe, you know, maybe um, the nickel ion type batteries will reach some uh, physical block on, in, on improved performance, but then a new set of materials are already coming yep. in. 
Uh, okay, so we have three left. Collective wisdom, imperfectionism, and show and tell. So uh, let's jump to collective wisdom. And we can yeah. do each one quickly, and then we'll jump to the action items. Yeah, we'll do it super quickly. So look, collective wisdom is, is the ultimate hum humility. And we think that that's really important for imperfectionists. And that is to say, and you know, this is stealing a line from Bill Joy, the famous founder of Sun Microsystems, before that at Berkeley, which is, hey, the smartest people probably don't work in your company, yep. right? And Bill Joy, instead of saying, damn, he said, how can I get them laboring in my garden? <laughs> and, you know, he was part of that open source software movement that created Unix. Um, and, uh, and that idea of coming together with incredible talent from outside shouldn't be just something that we do with open source software. And in the world we live in today, where we have crowdsourcing platforms and competition platforms like Kaggle, organizations can try to do things that are well outside their own capabilities by offering small rewards for other talented people to help them crack their problems. So super fast, but the Nature Conservancy is not a artificial intelligence organization, but they used a Kaggle competition mm. to, to create a, a AI driven computer vision approach to um, not catching endangered fish species aboard boats. So taking video photography, the algorithm looks for gill plate structure and fin structure so they can quickly say, that's an endangered tuna, please put that over the side, yeah. right? A perfect example of an organization that outsourced an incredibly important bit of capability so that it could achieve its mission, which is conserving the world's fish species, hmm. right? And with artificial intelligence, there's a, a million new ideas about ways we can access the, the, the broader collective wisdom and intelligence that doesn't exist within ourselves. Yeah, uh, I, I like that. Um, and I think that's been talked about for a little while too, but not practiced well, um, right. especially with technology. It's so easy to, to tap into the collective intelligence and wisdom of so many people. Um, let's jump to the next one, which is my favorite one. Um, imperfectionism, something that uh, I think a lot of people struggle with. I sometimes struggle with this as well. So what exactly is imp imperfectionism? Why is it so crucial of a mindset for us to embrace? Yeah, and it's sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's an individual mindset, but it's also the kind of idea that binds all these things together, which is when you're faced with um, radical change and uncertainty, you can freeze or you can leap before you look, or you can intelligently lean into that risk by doing some of the things we've already talked about. Yep. Right? But most importantly, you can identify steps that you can take that are relatively modest in cost and that are reversible. And you can run two or three of those things at the same time so that you gather information, you build intelligence about the game that's being played, and you often add capabilities and assets to your quiver so that you can actually move toward your strategic objectives. Like a staircase, but yes, a staircase where some of the stairs are out. And that's why you usually like to run two or three strategies. We started off by talking about Amazon and I think it's a wonderful um, exemplar of a company that has very clear strategic objectives, but which is a classic imperfectionist when it comes to actually executing strategy. Yeah. Um, as they were entering consumer finance, they bought a little company, they invested in another little company, they hired a team from a failed fintech, they started their own competitor to Square. Um, all of those moves failed mm. uh, on the face of them. But I, each of those initiatives was shut down, but they didn't fail because each of those moves helped Amazon build the capabilities and confidence to, to the point where they now have a 24% payment share across the e-commerce economy in the United States. Wow. So they leaned into risk and they learned as they built. Essentially, they're bootstrapping, to use an old-fashioned term. Yeah. All right, we have one last one, which is show and tell. Yeah, so look, when you're developing um, strategy in the world, uh, especially today, you need to bring other people along, right? You need to convince them that your vision of both objective and path makes sense. And what we wanted to encourage people here is to have a mindset that's much more playful than the kind of PowerPoint mindset. 
Um, and to remember that when you're convincing people um, that, that what you want to do makes sense, um, you actually need to speak not only to what's between their ears, but what's in their hearts. And we encourage people here to think of themselves as visual storytellers, not just as PowerPoint producers. Um, so, you know, I'll, I, the, the one example that comes to mind is one also with the Nature Conservancy where Rob, my co-author, was involved in um, a pitch to a big philanthropic organization. And what they did, instead of having a bunch of PowerPoints, was they had 17 green plastic buckets in a pyramid in the back credenza of the, of the room that they were presenting in. All the executives from the uh, foundation filed in, and the first thing they were said was, what are the buckets about? It grabbed their attention. And what they were talking about that day was using um, shellfish reefs to clean estuary water, mm -hmm. which is subject to all kinds of runoff, especially fertilizer runoff. And the point of the buckets is each single oyster in, a, in an oyster reef filters 170 liters a day, wow. 17, 10 liter buckets, right? And that visual created a dynamic in the room that was a thousand times better than a set of tables. Yeah. And it spoke to people's hearts as well as, um, as, well as their minds. And uh, they got the support. And I guess we, what we're encouraging folks in, in this topsy-turvy world where people don't trust what other people are saying now is to think about how you speak in, you know, they're, this is famously called speaking to frames, yeah. um, is, is to think about how we can speak to people's values, not just to their logic. Got it. Um, okay, so for the last uh, 15 minutes or so, in a segment I like to call the Leader's Toolkit, I thought we could look at some <clears throat> action items related to these six strategy mindsets. And if we have time, I have maybe one or two more questions for you. But how can we start to bring this inside of our organizations? So maybe we can go through these six again and talk about how do we implement things like curiosity or yeah. dragonfly. Um, so let's start with curiosity. How do we bring that mindset um, into our organizations or even practice it as individual leaders? All right, everybody, my conversation with Charles continues only for subscribers on Substack. That's greatleadership.substack.com. And in our continued conversation, Charles is actually going to give specific action items that you can implement, things that you can actually practice um, in order to master these six strategy mindsets that he talks about. So in our conversation, we talked about what they are, but how do you actually practice them? How do you bring them to life inside of your organization? If you wanna find out, head over to greatleadership.substack.com and you can subscribe over there. I promise it's a discussion you are not going to want to miss. And all of my best content, uh, all the latest thinking is now uh, being held on Substack. Um, including these bonus interviews, articles that I write, uh, five-minute leadership hacks that we send out every week. So again, greatleadership.substack.com. I hope to see you there.